welcome to the NBA Board of Five meeting. Um, it is Thursday, June 15th. It's a wonderful late spring, no other day. So glad you're here with us. Um, we just have a couple of folks in the room. Um, if you're not here and you're online, you're looking on some absolutely delicious food made by Bree and the Tifa's Kitchen. Um, I've got some fried tofu and rice and vegetables and salad in my bowl. Um, so if you're if you're not here with us, but you're you're listening and join us next time, um, and we'll show you some some really good food. My name is Lena. I use they pronouns. I live in the north end of the south end of the Soul Live Live the Promise. Um, and fine. I love this neighborhood. Um, and I'm excited about our meeting tonight. So, just a couple of guiding principles about the NBA meetings before we get into our agenda. We've got some several ideas for both of us. This is a safe space. We like to provide a welcoming forum for people who would like to speak, ask questions, talk to each other. We have some community time before our meetings start so that there is a free form opportunity to connect with each other. Um, but the, the space remains safe um, even when the community time mm -hmm. shifts into meeting. Um, we aim to make this an accessible meeting and reduce barriers to participation with all of our community members. If you've got ideas about how to make this more accessible, please let us know. Um, we intend to be respectful with respect to cultural and economic differences and values and perspectives. And we want this to be a relevant, creative, and fun space. This is a meeting for all of us. Some of us are on the steering committee, um, and we'll, we'll identify ourselves in a moment. Um, and some of us are not, but it is everyone's NBA. Um, and then we don't endorse political candidates. We're here to talk about our neighborhood and make sure it's important to our neighborhood. Um, so this is not an inherently political space. So again, I'm Lena, and then I'm Cherry Rivers. So I'm on the committee. Roger Grasser, Lyman Avenue. Joe Derry, Ferguson Ave. Jason Van Dreich, Caroline Street, and Go Tigger. Jason. And Bree is also on our trip with me and they grow the food. Thank you so much, Bree. Um, and if you'd like to find us online and you haven't yet, these are two websites where you can find information about our work. The first is managed by us, the second is managed by the city. That's where you can and notes and links, all of that good stuff. Um, thank you, Sam, for creating and doing all of our tech. Um, and we're on we're on town meeting team. Um, before we get too far, just a quick rundown of Zoom, um, which thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think we've all done this a couple of times at this point, but just in case, um, if you're in participant mode on Zoom, you're seeing the hand function. If you want to say something during the public forum or if you have a question for one of our presenters, please go ahead and hit that button. Otherwise, if you're in the presenter mode, unmute yourself only when it's your turn to speak so we can all hear each other well. Um, and you can turn the video on whatever makes you want to talk about. Okay, now turn to good stuff. So this evening, we're going to start off with the public forum as always. Um, with certain questions, announcements, discussion items, you name it. Um, and then we'll hear a legislative update, update from our state representatives. Um, and I'm going to spread that right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to go into an update from our city councilors about some stuff going on in Burlington. Mm -hmm. We're going to adjourn a little bit of the evening um, around the week And before we start public forum, just a friendly reminder that we are not meeting in July for the break. Um, some of us on the steering committee are talking about what kind of event we want to hold instead of a meeting in a room. Um, if you have ideas, please get in touch with us. Um, we're, we're right here, um, and otherwise, we're either fine via any of those websites. Um, we want to hear your thoughts about what kind of event we should hold. Hmm. Uh, that's all I've got, except for the ground rules for the public forum. Please identify yourself before you speak. Um, tell us your name, where you live, if you're affiliated with the organization as you speak with us, and please be respectful of all of our time. Um, keep your comments for four minutes, and I will give you a little wait after three minutes if we're really uh, bending our ears. So with that, we would like to speak at public forum. Hey, Andy. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Andy Simon. I uh, live on Locust Street. And I used to be on the steering committee and I'm not anymore. Um, uh, I'm here to just make an announcement about uh, events at the Pine Street Barge Canal. Uh, I'm part of a group called um, Friends of the Barge Canal. And uh, we've been doing various things to conserve, protect, remediate, and um, and to educate people about the Barge Canal, one of those things is to offer mini tours of the Barge Canal because so many people walk by on uh, the bike path or on Pine Street and never actually get to see this 28 acres of wild space in our in right in the midst of the South End. So once a month, uh, we are offering uh, just a tour, just a walking tour of the Barge Canal anybody that wants to come. It's always going to be on the first Saturday of uh, July, August, September, October. And uh, we do it at nine o'clock in the morning, which is a barbaric time for some people. But, um, you know, we've already been up for several hours. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, this, the next uh, date is July 1st, Saturday, July 1st. Um, after the, the 9 to 10 mini tour on Saturday, July 1st, uh, we are going to have a, a short work day for people who want to come or stick around after the mini tour to be picking up more trash because there's always more trash at the Barge Canal, to be working on controlling non-native species like buckthorn. Um, we're also going to be doing trail maintenance because there are a few trails that uh, lead in um, and uh, working on other kinds of maintenance for projects that we've been doing down there. So that is 10 to 12 on Saturday, July 1st. We also, um, if you can't make it on a Saturday and you'd like to have a small group uh, come down on a different day, we can be contacted at sosburlington at gmail.com. That's sosburlington at gmail.com or through the website, uh, which is pinestreetbargecanal.org uh, for Friends of the Barge Canal. And for instance, Jack and Daisy here uh, came down last Sunday with a group of people from VPOP uh, because they couldn't make it on Saturday. So uh, we're glad to schedule um, impromptu tours uh, that aren't on that scheduled day. Thank you very much. Did you say Pine Street Barge Canal.org? Pine Street Barge Canal.org. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. My name's Ruby Perry. I live in Ward 5, about a block away, and I wanted to let people know about a meeting, a symposium that was held at in City Hall earlier this week. And I, it was really interesting. It was um, hosted by the city council meeting, uh, the city council committee called TUC, which is the Transportation <laughs> Energy Utility, <laughs> right? Transportation Energy um, Council, right? Utilities. Committee. Utilities. And what they were talking about was. Um, the McNeil plant and wood burning in general as uh, as a viable form of of um, renewable energy. And there and it, uh, Darren Springer was there from from uh, BED doing an amazing job of summarizing the work that BED does around that. But there were also um, two scientists there talking about the numbers basically of of what it means to be burning wood in terms of carbon sequestration and what it means in terms of policy shifts that are coming down the pike so it was quite eye-opening and the reason i mention it now um is because there's a youtube recording of it that you can tune into and get all of that uh in, in your own time and in your own home, <laughs> not have to go to City Hall. And I think it will be, that address will be included in the minutes when uh, when they go out from this committee, from the MPA. So take a, take a look and see what you think. And thank you.
Okay, so if you ever want to see something that's recorded on CCTV and see it on YouTube, ah. you can find it. But the way to find it from CCTV is to go to cctv.org. You put the date, but you know the date of the event. Everything ah. recorded that day is going to pop up. Oh, excellent. That's much easier. So go to CCTV, put in June 13th. June what? 13th. June 13th. And Charlie, do you know if it's up yet? No, you don't know. Um, probably not. It might be. I haven't checked it. Probably not. It might be tomorrow. Having a way to get to things easily online. Thank you for that. It's great. <clears throat> Anyone else? For you probably don't have ads on CCTV, right? Yes. Um. <laughs> My name is Daisy. I use she, her pronouns. I live in the South Ends in um, off of Marble and St. Paul in the corner. Um, I just want to maybe raise some awareness about a particular crosswalk that I think is really dangerous. Um, Smalley Park, which I don't think is technically Ward, ward 5, but... I think it's between Ward 5 and Ward 6, but the crosswalk that I am particularly concerned with is, I think, technically in our ward. Um, so it's the crosswalk on St. Paul that you cross to go into Smalley Park if you're on the opposite side. Um, the lines are pretty much gone. You can't really see those lines. There is a sign there to let you know that that is a crosswalk, but I'm just kind of concerned that a child is going to get into a situation with a car there because the basketball court is right mm -hmm. there and if a basketball like rolls down into the street it goes down um like a slant and if you're an eight-year-old kid you might not be thinking that there's cars going like over the speed limit on that road um i did email our counselors to ask about getting a in street um uh, crossing sign put in there but I, I haven't heard anything back so if anyone knows who i could contact or <laughs> ask about getting something put into that street um let me know and if you're walking around just take a look at that crosswalk and think if you would want your child or a child of any type crossing that or if you would want to cross there or any yeah any pedestrian daisy just to let you know the city councilors are going to be at this meeting later on so they're on the agenda you could ask them to write. like physically in the room ah. okay yeah. physically in the room there. yep okay right here i haven't heard otherwise there's also, <laughs> there's also a thing called see click fix yeah, I have actually submitted some things to that, and mm -hmm. I I don't see a lot of those signs around, like the in-street crossing signs. I think they're good for calming traffic, but I only have seen them by like the Champlain campus, so I don't I don't know if they're just not something that we use. Um, the ones that you can put in the middle of the crosswalk, so if there's like something in the street and you're driving, you will slow down because you might think you're going to hit it um but they're they're like four hundred dollars from what i've looked into so they're like a pretty cheap option as opposed to one of those flashing signs that i think are like ten thousand dollars or something crazy mm. interesting anyone else for public yeah hi i'm fareed um i live in uh, on lesmere street um i have uh, an announcement and a comment. The announcement is there will be a People's Pride celebration in Burlington. It's going to be in Oak Ledge Park, so right in our backyard. It's going to be on Saturday, June 24th. This is not the official sponsored Pride. This is more of a people uh, grassroots uh, type of Pride. Um, so uh, it's open to everybody and uh, uh, June 24th. Uh, and uh, starting at 3 p.m. at Oak Ledge Park. Um, my comment is uh, about the recent appointment of uh, the chief, uh, um, acting chief Murad, into a permanent chief. Mm -hmm. I want to congratulate the chief. Um, I know some people see it as, uh, you know, as the status quo being maintained. I don't particularly feel strongly either way who the chief is. I am more concerned about the accountability mechanism uh, for our police department. Um, but uh, through this confirmation hearing, 
Um, one thing that actually really resonated with me that the mayor says, keeps saying over and over again regarding mm -hmm. the incident at the hospital, is that the chief actually already apologized. And that really, I mean, I think that that's really a, a great thing. And I, I know there are communities who have been harmed by the police department. And I would like to suggest uh, that Chief Murad uh, well, as one of his first acts to actually acknowledge the harm that's done and apologize. Mm -hmm. I think that would go a long way towards rebuilding trust with the community that have been harmed. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> online or in the room for our remaining public forum. All right. I can take it. Yeah, right. Round off the, the announcement table. Um, so just, uh, my name is Jack Tiano. Um, I live on St. Paul and Marble as well. Um, mostly, I just kind of wanted to put an idea out there. Um, as I've been getting more engaged with the community, especially coming to the MPA, one thing that I really would like to see is a collaborative conversation around what the future of you know, our neighborhood looks like, of Ward 5 specifically, in terms of how we handle both um, the climate crisis and the housing crisis, all of these compounding crises is gonna ask change from all of us. And when we think about the equity um, involved in that, it's it's a long-term uh, complicated conversation. And so that means thinking about how do we, as the city starts moving to think about zoning changes, I know the Southern Innovation District is a big thing going on right now, but it's probably going to ask even more from us, especially in the lower res the lower density areas of the city, to think about how our neighborhoods can change and evolve and accommodate more people. Um, so anyway, I don't have like a thing to pitch or a, a place to go or an upcoming event, but just to kind of put that out there and kind of plant that seed and maybe try to find some other people that might be interested in starting that conversation in a more active way. Um, but anyway, that's it from me. Thanks. Thank you. We'll keep talking now. All right, thus concludes the forum. I'm going to hand it over to our representatives. I think we're okay here. I mean, just get out. Take it away. Do we have enough microphones? We have an, an abundance of these. <laughs> you want to go first? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting us. Um, uh, Representative Gabrielle Stebbins. Uh, and I guess I'll start off with sort of an overarching um, perspective, which is, uh, as you've probably heard in the news, um, there have been a number of bills that the governor has leaved out. So we will all be going back to the state house next week, Tuesday through Thursday, uh, is the current plan. Um, bills like updating the 50-year-old bottle bill, um, the child care bill, um, a lot of a lot of the bills that uh, he vetoed, I would say um, the structure has the, the comments have generally been that it's you know too costly or uh, that it's um, sort of a, a, a stick approach to government, uh, something along those lines. That's that's sort of um, most of what he has said. Not all. Uh, sometimes he has other feedback on why he's chosen to veto bills, but. Um, so with that being said, one of the bills he budgeted, uh, one of the bills he vetoed was the budget, which kind of means that actually, unless uh, unless a bill only had policy and had no money, pretty much nothing that we did actually moved forward as of yet. Um, because uh, you know, if if you design a like a let's say a uh, a bill pertaining to judiciary uh, and the court systems, and there was no money uh, in it. Um, that could actually move forward because it doesn't trigger any money. But literally everything else, which is a lot, uh, has money in it, and therefore it doesn't move forward until and unless um, we are able to uh, move the budget forward. And as um, probably many of you have heard, uh, there has been um, just incredible, um, challenging, uh, heartbreaking um, uh, conversations uh, and real life situations with the uh, the motel program ending. Um, basically, the the motel program for unhoused people 
uh, was able to run for about three years or so with federal dollars. Um, and it's not a program that federal, uh, sorry, that just state funds can maintain in perpetuity um, for as many people as it has. It's also really not a great program. I mean, it's great in terms of the sense that it's a, a shelter, um, but for a lot of these not, not for everybody, but for a lot of uh, the folks using the motel program, they need services. Uh, they need other support. If you think about a motel, like there's no kitchen, there's no, you know, it's not, it's not really a long-term policy to have people who don't have homes live in motels. It is better than tents. Um, all of that to be said, uh, the way the budget process works is it starts in the house, then it goes to the Senate, and then it goes to the governor. Uh, and the House, uh, actually last year, we put into the budget money and language to have uh, the executive branch, the administration, figure out a phased plan for the motel program ending, because we knew it would end. That did not happen. Um, and so uh, we ended up um, in a situation where uh, May came and went. We did pass a budget. Um, the governor vetoed it. The governor vetoed it because it was too expensive, which leaves us in a place where even if the House were to increase the budget, it's likely that the Senate would have um, probably cut it down and then the governor would veto it anyway. So it's a bit of a stalemate um, as of about a week ago. Yeah. And uh, about a week ago, uh, there have just been a lot of efforts underway to figure out an alternative path. Um, that is still being worked out. So there's a lot of hope that by next Tuesday, we will have a way that will be less harmful and less painful um, for everybody who uh, is not in the motel system and, and has been kicked out. Um, Tiff has been following this a lot more, so I will let her cover that. Um, more and also the budget. I was given the task, I just wanted to set the framework that technically like 85% of what we've done, I think, hasn't moved forward because it's all tied up with the budget, but we are hopeful that next week we will um, be able to, to see progress, um, both in terms of the housing uh, challenges and the budget, as well as like the bottle bill and many, many other bills that were vetoed. Um, that being said, my area of jurisdiction to cover in tonight's conversation is really, I, I serve on the Environment and Energy Committee, which is a phenomenal committee. We cover so much. Um, I actually get to write down notes because of how much we cover. Uh, we worked on uh, climate workforce language and money so that we could actually uh, see more dollars go into skilled trades, so we could see more weatherization, we could see more um, you know, shifting insulation, air sealing of our buildings. Uh, we worked on uh, a biodiversity bill um, that uh, for folks who may or may not know, about 70% of Vermont's land is privately owned. So it's a very, um, it's a very uh, relationship focused conversation when you're talking about preserving Vermont's land, because you're talking about land that is predominantly privately owned. Um, so in this bill, basically, it's bringing all of the stakeholders together to figure out a plan so that by 2030, we have 30% of Vermont land and waters uh, preserved in one way or another. It could be working lands. It could be, uh, it, so they're, they're different preservation models. But And then by 2050, it would be 50%. Um, this is really important in terms of uh, how we're seeing growth occur in Vermont, uh, in terms of uh, just long-term sustainability, having enough uh, woods and water and food resources. Um, so it's a really long-term vision. Um, we also passed the Affordable Heat Act, uh, which does not require Vermonters to do anything, but if they want to, they will be given more information, more resources, and more incentives uh, to get their homes off of fossil fuels. Um, predominantly, there, there's a real focus on this bill for lower income and moderate income Vermonters, uh, because for folks who can pay, like myself, I mean, we've already put in two heat pumps, we've already done the air insulation and all of that. So this is really about, as we see more people like me doing this on their own, we have a good sense of who's gonna be stuck, you know, uh, not necessarily being able to pay their bills 20 years from now, because maybe there's so much fewer people heating with gas or oil. 
Uh, and so it's the folks who have the least amount of money who probably won't be able to shift. And then they actually end up getting into an even tougher situation 20 years out. So that is the concept behind the Affordable Heat Act. Technically, over the next year and a half, what it really does is set up the regulations and the rules. Um, we have to vote on it again in a year and a half uh, to actually uh, turn the key on to the car to make the program run. Because um, there was so much concern statewide uh, that this is you know, too much, too fast, um, that it would hurt people to afford it. Uh, so the entire program, once it's designed from start to finish, comes back to the state house in a year and a half for a full revote. So that'll be a very um, intense conversation. Um, <laughs> fourth try, household hazardous waste. Vermont is the first nation in the US to require that manufacturers are gonna have to pay uh, and develop the program for how to manage household hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. So if you think about you know, your uh, great uncle three times removed, they pass away. You go into their home, it's full of like weird left paintovers, you know, leftover paints from 30 years ago, some weird residual paint thinner. And you're like, what do I do with this? You're like, I don't know. So how many people like throw it out in the trash? Not good. Um, how many people bring it to the household hazardous waste day? A lot, but you know, not everybody. Anyway, so um, our great solid waste management um, entities like Chitin and Solid Waste has been taking this. But the way they've been dealing with it is to absorb the cost and then also send a portion of the cost to all of us. Um, so this is actually over the next year and a half, I think, or so, um, basically going to require all of these manufacturers, global manufacturers, um, to put together a stewardship organization that will figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and then we'll also... Uh, It'll probably still be chicken and solid waste that manages it, but basically we're not paying for it and they have to own it. And the cool thing about that is when you start to put it off at the manufacturing stream, they start thinking, okay, well, how can we how can we make our packaging smaller? How can we make this actually, you know, a different nozzle so that like even less can leak out by accident? And you start to have much deeper systemic change. So very cool, Vermont First the Nation. Um, Representative Mary Sullivan worked on Sullivan worked on that for three sessions, uh, and I happen to be the lucky one to carry it over the finish line. Bottle bill, that's uh, 50 years of the same old, same old, and hopefully we will be able to veto that and uh, undo the veto. Um, and then another bill that my committee worked on was you guys probably have heard about the home bill. I think it's a very odd term in my mind. I, I never thought of it as the home bill. I think of it as S100. Uh, it does a couple of things, basically, um, not so much in Burlington, Burlington, but in, in other communities, maybe in Burlington, in other communities, um, if, uh, if you can build a single family home, uh, you may not be able to do a duplex there um, because it's they're just certain zoning rules from like 10, 20, 30 years ago. So this basically establishes duplex by right. Um, which also makes it a, a fair amount more affordable if you can if you think about it if you're if you're going to be able to build a home split it in half you live in half of it and someone else lives in the other half it allows for more affordability more density um, there is also uh, there there are a lot of more details but predominantly it's focused on um, how to guide development where we want it which is where we already have water and sewer for the most part um, and where we already have some development. And that combined with, uh, you know, some of the work in the 30 by 30, 50 by 50, like how do we want to accept the climate refugees that we're going to see move to Vermont over the next 10, 20, 30 years? How do we want to um, see Vermont change in a thoughtful way? So with that, I will pass the baton. Um, you are so you. efficient. Well done. <laughs> yeah, most of the way too. Yes, oh, and then in transportation, because I wasn't sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Totally in transportation, I, I was in that committee last time around. Uh, transportation did a lot of work again in terms of um, uh, like really looking at how to make uh, communities more walkable, bikeable. Um, there's this term complete streets um, that uh, at the at the state level right now, um, there's if VTrans is going to do a project, they're supposed to sort of check to see if what they're proposing is going to be bikeable and walkable and um and they kind of check and see and and uh you know if they're like nah, it's not going to really work then that's that so what we did was basically put in more teeth 
um, so that we start to make it so you have to report how many projects have you looked at this? Um, why did you not do it? Like there are situ situations where it does not make sense to do a complete street. If you have a road right along a river bank, like sorry, bicyclists are gonna have to share the road, right? Um, but there are many other situations where if if society says we really want this a walkable and bikeable community and not so car focused, then we need to take a little bit more time and focus on it and plan for it. So there's a lot in the transportation bill related to public transit, related to complete streets, um, you know, your typical, your typical roads, bridges, trains, um, airports, because that's important too, and electric vehicles, electric bikes, and now I'll stop. Oh, that's all good. <clears throat> um, so uh, what we, when Gabrielle and I last summer were talking to people in different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, Tell everybody who you are. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just lonely. Um, and uh, I also represent um, uh, Ward 5 <clears throat> and 6 in our, um, in what is Chittenden 14, 13, but sorry, 13. <laughs> Um, when, when, when we were talking to folks last summer and fall, um, at our little neighborhood lemonade stands, um, we, we, and we asked people what really concerned them the most things people said, like housing, substance use, uh, mental health and childcare. <clears throat> Paid family leave was in there somewhere, um, sometimes. And <clears throat> So when, so I serve on the appropriations committee, um, which um, develops the budget from the policy committee recommendations and given what the governor has proposed, et cetera. Um, I'll tell you what I'm particularly excited about and, and what we were able to do on those fronts that, that I think will make a difference. One, <clears throat> we've been bleeding um, staff at places like Howard Center, um, mental health professionals who work um, uh, uh, in <clears throat> lots of different capacities, um, uh, and and for two decades they've been underfunded. The Medicaid reimbursement, the allowable rate, has been held low, so low that. <clears throat> Um, Howard has something like, I don't know what, 300 vacancies. Um, and, and that is, that contributes to the mental health crisis, um, obviously, because people have to wait too long to, to get in <clears throat> to have treatment. What, what we were able to do, and this was a major priority, of both the healthcare committee and the um, human services committees were to, um, boost the Medicaid reimbursement rate to the tune of $99 million. That goes into the base budget. That's something that then <clears throat> those agencies and professionals can count on. Um, and these are substance use counselors, it's um, mental health counselors and um, doctors, um, primary care physicians, EMS workers. Um, it, it is, we have underfunded them for 20 years. And <clears throat> I think we'll see a benefit down the road for that. Substance use treatment, mental health treatment, um, uh, the health committee and the um, human services committees expanded what's called the hub and spoke treatment system, um, which will then make air accessible to more Vermonters in more parts of, of Vermont, establish a, a statewide network of mobile crisis units, which will then be equipped to address substance use and mental health crises um, that will help reduce the pressures on our um, emergency departments. Um, <clears throat> we've invested in recovery housing, uh, more recovery housing. Um, th those folks are not able to bill against Medicaid and the state has not invested in them. And this was the first time we got a $1 million appropriation in for, for that housing um, and for vouchers for somebody's first month's rent um, and security deposit. Um, <clears throat> there's settlement money that you've probably heard about in the news related to um, uh, the opiate um, uh, cases. And um, through that, we're gonna be able to make Narcan more readily available. 
we're going to be able to test drugs um, for things like fentanyl, um, <clears throat> see um, what they're, um, the, which will help protect. We don't really have that kind of capacity right now. Um, and, <clears throat> um, you know, you've probably also read a lot about youth mental health. And um, for the first time, we're developing a co-located physical, um, medical and um, uh, mental health facility for youth um, in down in, um, in Bennington. It was the only facility that actually responded to the RFP. I do think there will be other, um, <clears throat> There will be more available um, in the next section session because I don't think we did enough as it relates to mental health um, treatment, especially for youth. Um, but <clears throat> it is a step in the right direction. Um, housing. <clears throat> um, so we the budget dedicated two hundred and eleven million dollars to housing. <clears throat> it, that's the largest amount that it has you know, annual amount that it has dedicated. Um, 109 million of that is to develop affordable housing. <clears throat> um, uh, and then 102 million is to provide emergency shelter, transitional housing for folks coming out of prison or folks who are leaving foster care um, or services that are tied to emergency shelter um, or um, um, temporary um, housing and <clears throat> I can I can talk I'd like to go back to that in a second just to pick up a little bit on what um Gabrielle said but we also committed ourselves to universal school meals um and the governor allowed that to pass without its signature um it is um <clears throat> Given the testimony that that um, the General Assembly heard, it, it has made a huge difference in the um, in reducing stigma for kids at school. Um, and so, <clears throat> I uh, it's a it's a controversial bill in terms of its cost. What is it? Twenty three million. Um, but it is um, <clears throat> it's food for kids. And um, I think the only thing that people are are object to is why aren't people who can pay for it paying for it, and why are um, <clears throat> and just the cost of that, given the other things that we invested in. Um, and the big disappointment was paid family leave, <clears throat> which was really sacrificed to childcare. Um, as somebody who spent pretty much two decades working towards paid family leave. That was really hard to lose that, and it would. It, the argument with the Senate was over the funding source, um, and you know the Senate wanted to fund childcare um, through uh, through the payroll tax, as did the House want to fund um, the pay family the payroll tax. So uh, that that I know is on the docket for next year. Um, that was my my personal. That was that was the hardest thing, um, and but second hardest was the fight over housing and for um, uh, emergency housing because uh, there were a number of folks who were working very hard throughout the whole session to try to build more money into the budget so that folks could have a reasonable we could reasonably transition folks. Um, and <clears throat> from the motel system, the, as Gabrielle said, the governor has had three years to figure out how we're going to ramp this down. And, um, and when he presented his budget adjustment act, <clears throat> it had nothing in it for the motels beyond March 15th, but house appropriations and, and human services, <clears throat> put $23 million in so that we could take people through June <clears throat> to June and through the end of, of June. And um, <clears throat> and then we put in the house, put in 20 million more dollars in addition to adding 10 more to the base um, appropriation for emergency housing. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't 
and knew it wasn't enough. <clears throat> um, but it came much closer to where to to being enough than the Senate version did. And I, you know, I, I it's not helpful to point fingers, but this is the process. So <clears throat> you pass something out of the House. It goes to the Senate. They passed something. They stripped out the $20 million that had been put in um, uh, specifically for emergency housing. And then we had to go to conference committee. And in conference committee, we lost pretty much <clears throat> on every count. Um, not every, but we, we lost a lot of things. And that was one of them. And um, so <clears throat> then you're faced with a choice. Do you vote for the budget or don't you? And I think that it is uh, it is a fine principle stand for people to have um, opposed the budget that came back from the conference committee. <clears throat> I happen to know how hard our conferees worked to try to get more money into the budget, and the reason that it, that that the twelve and a half million you may have heard about um, uh, was. The last thing that was done is because there was resistance to doing anything more until the last minute. So um, <clears throat> so there have been a lot of people involved in trying to sort this out. Um, I do, I'm hopeful that when we go to the, when we go um, uh, next week that uh, the Senate and the House will have come to an agreement um, at, in consultation with the folks who have opposed the budget and we'll have something we can vote through because to do to not vote the budget through everything that i have read and from every conversation i've had would be catastrophic we have <clears throat> and i know that there are other folks who will who will argue um, but we will have, um, <clears throat> we have to have a budget July 1st or the government shuts down. There's, there, there isn't any way for the government to keep going without a budget. And secondly, we, if we, if we, <clears throat> we are likely, if we don't overwrite a veto and have to write a whole new budget, our budget will be closer to the governor's budget. Um, and we did, our budget is radically different from what the governor proposed. Um, and so it's been heartbreaking to watch all this, um, uh, play out. And, and I am, um, I'm sorry we couldn't get this right the first time. Um, but I'm hopeful that we can get it right when we go back. Um, now I'll shut up. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm sure people have comments, yeah. questions. Please feel free to feel comments and questions. We've got seven or eight minutes until bringing here from our city representatives, so they will first one we're going to a lot of things have a lot. So we'll just try to Please go. Is that the only one? Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask about VHS. It, it sounded like from the superintendent that they have. I'm telling you, I got the whole list, including VHS. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, so there are like a lot of other committees we didn't really talk about, like agriculture committee. Like we had a small grants program for. Don't talk about okay. Okay. Just answer. Anyway, there are, <laughs> there's a lot of other stuff. VHS uh, in the budget. The budget. Uh, there is 16 million uh, this year for uh, addressing um, PCB remediation. Uh, and the approach on from both the House and the Senate side was to divide up. Um, so to focus uh, one element on uh, the technical center uh, at the high school, which is really a, a shared resource. It should not just be Burlingtonians who pay for it since um, it's you know, the technical center for so many towns and communities. So that is uh, one um, sliver of focus. Then there was another sliver of focus, which was specifically on uh, getting uh, dollars this year for PCB remediation. And that's the 16 million. Yeah, I the third sliver. Third sliver. There was a third sliver. 16 million all for Burlington High School or yes. across multiples? Burlington High School. Okay. 
but there is a and yeah so between the tech center and the 16 million and whatever this third sliver is that i'm trying to that i cannot remember but i can follow up um we are hoping to get you know the tech center was about 10 million that yeah. was discussed. There's also federal money that's coming in. But anyway, but the bottom line is $16 million. And I'll tell you, that was really hard fought. There were so many amendments on the floor to strip that out of that bill and to, um, or to make Burlington pay it back if it won the lawsuit. Um, yep. It was, that was wow um, and if you if you want to send a little bit of love you do have a burlingtonian representative who sits in house education uh and um she i mean we all worked pretty hard on this i would say the entire burlington reps and senators but um she in particular mary Catherine stone um sitting on that committee really working very hard um because when you're when you're in the committee of jurisdiction you have so much more ability to really uh, yeah, to, to have those meaningful conversations one on one with other committee members to explain like why this is so critical and why it should be a decision that they support. Are those education funds or capital funds or no? It's a special fund that was set up last year for remediation, <laughs> remediation. So it was taken out of that special pot. <clears throat> I don't know the mechanics of getting it to Burlington, um, but we can find that out. That's okay. We just want to pass the budget. <laughs> we should pass the budget so, first. Um, <laughs> what about all legal resident voting in Burlington? Well, it's coming up for- That's uh, another veto vote that we're gonna be doing right. next week. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it. it I, I don't I, I don't think there's a chance it will not be overridden given the vote that came out of the house and the, um, the fact that we passed that before, you know, Winooski enjoys that, um, and you know, Montpelier. So, anyway, yeah, <clears throat> I'm wondering. I know the conversation about the motel program is obviously still ongoing, but this is this is our community. Like, we're going to see the impacts, um, no matter who we are. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what we do that as we see people be forced onto the street and not really be able to offer them a viable alternative. Like what what should we do? So um not passing the button, but I will say that there have been I mean one good thing that has come of this is that there's been a lot more um coordination and communication amongst all the nonprofits. Um many of the municipalities, um, you know, uh CEDO, um Winooski, like a lot of the communities um not passing the buck being a state rep, but uh, in some ways we're a little bit higher up that particular totem pole compared to some of the work that CEDO has been doing. And but I, we did see a presentation last Monday uh, that had, there are, well, I mean, and, and group there, you know, there were um, 11 representatives at the city council meeting um, uh, a couple of weeks ago when Burlington's, um, Proposal uh, to the uh, it, it, the letter of interest that it sent to AHS was was proposed. There were at least twelve that attended um, a meeting in South Burlington from the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. I think that there are ways in which we can help, <clears throat> in part, to I, identify folks who are not actually meeting with AHS personnel who are living in motels right now and are not getting the services that they need um, and the kind of <clears throat> offboarding that they need um, to transition to something else. Because there are people that are falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And I do think the city of Burlington, I, I think, <clears throat> I, I mean, all of us should have had this in our sights because we knew that this was, that, that FEMA money was drying up. And and all of us should have had more of a plan. Um, I think that there, I know that there will be a group of people working with the Joint Fiscal Committee um, in the legislature to track, to really follow what is happening on the ground. Because we don't do very well as a legislature, as a part-time legislature, actually um, uh, 
not enforcing, but um, uh, tracking how things are actually, you know, are those grants actually getting out? Um, and that's a big part of the issue because all of these municipalities are going to send letters of, of intent um, to do this or that, establish a, a congregate shelter or to provide um, <clears throat> uh, um, services for folks um, during the day, et cetera. And, and we need to make sure they get the money. <clears throat> and actually, that is one of the bills that uh, we did pass. I don't know if it was vetoed, but basically it um, it establishes uh, like over the summer into the fall, uh, uh, a working group to figure out how the legislature can um, have a better sense of government accountability um, and what's happening. I mean, we don't where we close up shop in May, we respond to our emails, but it's not like we're there actually working. But your question was a little different, was what can we do individually? And I, I, I don't know if when the conversation shifts to our city councilors, if they may have any more of an update, a more recent update, because I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Has the legislature started to grapple with um, the shift over the last couple of years and what's going on with substance abuse and the uh, I read the seven days article a while ago about how the hub and spoke model is kind of not working in the face of new much more potent and damaging drugs. Is that something that you've started to wrap your arms around? And if so, how did that manifest this year? Well, I think that in fact the the um, settlement money, the proposed uses for the settlement money, it, it does try to address that by establishing this check, this facility that would actually check drugs that are on the street um, to see what is actually coming in to Vermont. We, um, we don't, <clears throat> we, we don't, we can't anticipate that quickly enough. Um, this will help. Um, I, we also have settlement money that has not been expended at all, um, and we've got $3 million for this year, and I think that there's, there's a lot of ideas out there, and the group that is directing the, the expenditure of that money is, I think, working pretty hard to understand the current landscape. Sorry, you didn't ask the question, Jason. Um, but to to understand the landscape and what what in addition to what they've already proposed is necessary. That's hard to keep up. <clears throat> okay. Thank you both so much. Really appreciate. Yeah, it. you know, I would yeah. we would really welcome feedback, and um, where you know how to reach us. Um, <clears throat> and we'll let you know what happens to this week. That's a lot. Of course, it's Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, um, is Ben not coming? We did not coordinate online. Our <laughs> representatives and Ben and I also um, sit on committees together, so we don't necessarily have different things to report on. I don't have enough of these to go around so people can share. These, this, what I'm passing out is, um, sorry, I'm not in the mic. Um, these are the tax rates hot off the press today. We're adopting the budget. Circuit party talk? Yeah, yeah. So you didn't, didn't get them to move them. So you get her around the tree. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a different. Oh, and I need kind of more Okay. Actually, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> nope, I can't see a thing with those glasses <laughs> up close. <laughs> I know everybody else puts their glasses on. I have to take mine off. Um, yes, so on Tuesday, Monday, Monday is Juneteenth. Um, it's the national celebration of Juneteenth. Burlington is celebrating Juneteenth on Saturday, and I hope you all 
um, get to spend some some time downtown. It's consolidated this year. It used to be all over town, and I found it very difficult to get to all the different things that I wanted to go to. So this year, it's um, it's much more consolidated, and there's uh, there's different events happening. I think they said something like fifty artists um, that will do, be doing everything from comedy to poetry to music. Um, so that will be that will be fun. Uh, so Tuesday, that's why our meeting is on Tuesday because of Juneteenth, and um, the budget is on our agenda to be adopted for Tuesday. This this really is hot off the press, and I haven't had time to. We have had budget presentations over the course of two months, and so each department comes and presents. Um, these presentations are all available online if you have interest in watching the Board of Finance meetings. Um, you learn a lot about how each department works and the different programs that they're doing. Um, so that my takeaway just from looking at this, that you look at two numbers, the budget tax rate and the projected taxes. So we can increase our revenue by increasing the tax base. So when you put an addition on your house, you're going to get reassessed and you can have the same tax rate, but you'll be paying more taxes. Likewise, if we build um, a building, that building will add to the tax base and allow the city more revenue without actually changing the tax rate. So that, that building gives the city more revenue, but your, tax, your taxes stay the same because the tax rate stays the same. So looking at this number with the tax rate, the tax rate has gone from 0.7 last year to 0.75 this year. And that's coming mainly from two sources. Um, one is parks. And I can't, I actually went back and rewatched that presentation to see if I could understand like why. I don't understand why. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna try and figure that out between now and Tuesday. The other um, increases are really in this category called budget-driven rates. And those are things that are really beyond our control. They're, they're regional, like GMT is regional, county tax, um, retirement, you know, that's money we have to pay so that we can pay our, in, we can pay our former employees, debt service. So those are all things that are kind of outside the city's control. So the one item that's adding to that increase in tax rate is parks. Um, then the, another thing that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, policing, where where we are. Uh, we did appoint Chief Murad, which um, I have been a strong advocate. I think that when you put anything under the microscope, scope, you're gonna see the flaws are really gonna jump out at you. I don't think we will ever know a chief the way we know Chief Murad. So of course, we're going to know, know his flaws or what we perceive as flaws because some people think, you know, this wasn't the right thing to do and other people think it was the right thing to do. But all in all, I think that he has really saved our police department over the last three years. If we, he could have left. He's a man who certainly has opportunities, would be hired in a heartbeat by almost any other organization. And he chose to stay with Burlington. And by him doing that, we were able to preserve some of our police force. I don't, I'm not sure that would be possible without him. So I am personally really grateful that he stayed. And I'm really happy with the appointment of the chief. Um, we have to understand, you hear a lot of numbers about how many police are approved. We have had, for decades, we had uh, 105 sworn officers was the approved number, but that doesn't tell you how many police are actually on toll, because among the sworn officers, we have detectives, we have Uzi people, um, we have people at the airport. So, we, last fall, we had 20 officers available for patrol to cover all of our shifts 24-7, um, 365. And that is quite obviously not enough 
to do even an okay job. And we all felt that. We're experiencing things like, um, I think I have heard three times, people calling about somebody trying to break into a home and being asked, are they in? And when they say no, they're told, call us back if they get in. And that is the very sad kind of triage that we have had to do in this community. So we are now up to 26 officers available for patrol. And um, the chief has also been very good in recruiting people in an extremely difficult recruiting environment because everybody is recruiting police officers. So I think we ended up with sending five officers to the academy, but keep in mind, that pipeline is probably, it's close to, it's 18 months to two years before somebody is fully onboarded. And then you have, you know, a very young police officer. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of our officers who have spent more time on the job, they, you learn a lot in that job over the course of time. So we want to, we want to retain our police officers and we are giving them a lot of incentives. And you will notice in that budget, that despite the very low number of police officers that we have, we're not saving any money by having less officers. We're having to pay officers far more than we've ever paid them. They're working tremendous amounts of overtime, which is quite honestly not very, not very healthy. Um, but they, they do have a sense of team, I think, in the department, and they're stepping up for each other and signing up for the Overtime, we do have some forced overtime as well. But I recommend for anybody more interested in that to look at um, the chief does a monthly report. It's available on the um, police department's website. And I recommend you go there and it kind of tracks over the course of time um, where we are going with um, reported crime, which is different than crime, uh, as well as the department, you know, how many people we have in different positions. And then the other big thing I think everybody is aware of is the South End Invita Innovation Center, which is right here. I'm sorry that John Callow um, left before, before this, because um, he's, he's lead on that project. I think that uh, somehow I have been painted as being opposed to this, which I am certainly not. I was consulted in the very beginning uh, of this and uh, you know by Russ Scully and I told him I was supportive of bringing housing um, to to this site to the South End. Obviously, we we desperately need housing, and I tried to give him some advice on on how to navigate a little bit. Since that time, I really haven't had direct conversations with Hula about what their plans are here, so I can't speak to that. Um, but this is certainly a once in a lifetime opportunity and I'm not of the opinion that our job is to rubber stamp what's been done by the planning commission or by the planning staff. There is a process at the city council that this is supposed to go through. Um, it goes through the ordinance committee, which Ben and I both, uh, are on the ordinance committee and there are new amendments being proposed now. Um, they haven't gone through, they're, they're being proposed by staff and they haven't gone through the Planning Commission. There are also things that the Planning Commission wasn't in full agreement on and other things that the City Council may, may want to question as well. Um, there has been a lot made about eight stories and support of eight story buildings because we need more housing. And the thing I want to really emphasize here is that eight-story buildings don't necessarily get you more housing. The limiting factor in this zoning ordinance is called the floor area ratio. The floor area ratio that's being proposed is 2.5 with the inclusionary housing that's required. Um, 2.5 is, is pretty high for Burlington. Looking, What we allow downtown is four. <laughs> what is built downtown is far less than that. And what it means is if you had a floor area ratio of one, you could build a one-story building that covered the entire lot, or you could build a two-story building that covered one half of the lot. 
So a floor area <coughs> ratio of 2.5 means you can build a two and a half story building that covers 100% of the lot, or you can build a five story building that covers 50% of the lot, or at, at eight stories, I think it's about 30% of the lot you can, you can cover. So there's two advantages, depending on how you look at it, um, uh, of eight story buildings. Uh, at eight stories, you have a lot more units with lake views than you do if you're building three story buildings. The other thing is you have, I won't call it green space because it's not required to be green space, but you have more open space. Um, it, it could be paved. Uh, and I don't know what the plan is, so I can't tell you whether that will be green space or paved space. Um, but since eight-story buildings only covering 30% of the lot, to me is a little bit of an odd format for building a city. Um, what we have been shown as community members for decades, trying to persuade us that you can have density that you like, we have been shown row houses fourplexes, things that are much denser than what we have, but we haven't been shown pictures, including um, drawings that are done to talk about the, the South End Innovation District. They show maybe six-story buildings. There's, there's not anybody really showing us what an eight-story building at a FAR of 2.5 looks like. I haven't seen it anyway. Um, so the argument on that has also been that if we allow eight-story buildings, we get more variety of buildings. And that is something I have questioned, because I want to understand how is that possible. I think that there is a lot of, um, there, there's reason to go up rather than go out because of the lake views, because you get higher rents when you go up. But we're also told by planning <coughs> staff that that type of building is not likely to be owner occupied. And if to get owner occupied buildings, those are gonna be the shorter row house type buildings. And I think Lena raised the issue at, at the meeting of it would be really nice to have small units that were owner, that you could <coughs> owner occupy. And that is really important as a community. Um, the mayor just put something out saying that Burlington uh, is 38% 30, of, of housing units in Burlington are owner-occupied. That number does not include people who live in nursing homes, and it doesn't include people who live in dormitories. And that number, it's, it's, uh, that is in this thing that I gave you. That's over 7,000 people in a city of 44,000 people that we are not counting in that statistic. So our city is, <coughs> we are experiencing very high rents. That means we have a community of people who are at the whim of, of landlords unless they are in subsidized housing. And home ownership, even if that home ownership means owning a very small apartment, stabilizes your housing cost. So one of my questions in this process is how are we gonna assure home ownership in this? Or are we going to be a city that is 80% renters, with many of those renters experiencing regular rent hikes? And even if we do uh, some form of rent control, whatever rent control we're going to do is still going to allow landlords to increase, um, increase their rents. Uh, so. Those are the kinds of questions that I'm asking and what I have shared. Um, I have more of these than I have of the tax thing. I was just begging the printer to print faster before I came in here and it was being purposely slow. Uh, but so I have this, which is a series of questions that I have asked the planning department. The ones that are highlighted, I thought would be a little bit more relevant for people. Some are, it's just kind of insider baseball. And then these were just some of my thoughts about the um, zoning, things that are going through my, my mind, things that I think um, 
as people are focused only on eight-story buildings or, you know, is Joan for or against eight-story buildings? There's actually a lot more to it than being for or against eight-story buildings. Um, and there's actually much more than what I put here. This was just, just a few thoughts. One of the other concerns I have with the proposal over here is that that they're only allowing like 20, I, I think 20 surface parking spaces per lot. These lots are very large. And I'm now wondering, was it 20 per lot or 20 per something else? 20 surface parking spaces, it seems they'll mostly be like handicapped parking. That's very, very little surface parking. Um, the rest is gonna have to be structured parking. Structured parking is very expensive. Um, and and also very unattractive. <laughs> um, it's going to add to the cost of rent. Uh, I read on Reddit that uh, Councillor Shannon does not understand the existing parking requirements. Um, we don't have a minimum parking requirement. However, parking is required by the market because my bet is most people in this room, even if you didn't drive your car here, you have a car parked somewhere. And so we need a place to put those cars and the requirement in this district is for structured parking. And then, so you can have some that is under a building. If you have all of your units stacked in eight stories, underground parking is more limited than if you have the same number of units taking up more surface area at say four stories or something, you park more cars underground. But then they want these parking structures to be separate from the buildings. So parking structures are just, to me, that's not building community. Mm -hmm. That is, they're, they're ominous places. They're places a lot of people in our community will not even go into, and they will not be wrapped by uses. Um, we were told that they've studied these things and wrapping is not the best practice. So they will be screened. They could be wrapped, but they won't be wrapped. Um, by, and by wrapped, I mean having like battery in college is, would be an example where you have the apartments, the um, parking garages behind that, and it's covered on two sides by the building itself. So that's wrapped at least on, on two sides. That is not a requirement in this district. Um, the parking can be separate and what was introduced at our last meeting was staff staff had several um, amendments that they wanted but one that I found very concerning is the idea that if they build public parking that won't be counted in the FAR that'll be exempt from the FAR if I understand this correctly so um, I think that's giving like a parking bonus. And I'm wondering who, who is the public that is parking here? We were told that it's Pine Street businesses who want to park, to park there. So one of my questions is who are the Pine Street businesses that want to park there? Because I know dealer parks on, on this side and they have their own building here. So I don't know if we're talking about dealer or, I, I don't really want to see this neighborhood become a neighborhood of parking structures intermixed with housing units. That's not the vision that I have. And so those are the kind, the parking actually is, is raising more concern for me than the height, but the height of the buildings is an issue, not by virtue of height itself, but these other factors. Um, so I will leave it at that. I have no idea what time it is or if I have over my time. Or I'm, I'm trusting you. that you would have cut me off. I've been looking at you and looking at the clock. We're doing great. It's 8.15. Um, we can certainly go past our 8.20 conclusion for those questions and if you're willing to stay. So I'd say let's turn it over to questions. I have a bunch, but I'm going to hold them um, for now. So by all means. Can I just grab my water? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll try not to say anything too far from my Anyone want to start us off? Yeah, go ahead. So, Joan, the right now the the ordinance committee is looking at changing the current zoning for this district, right? That's what the ordinance committee is doing, or have they already done that? 
We have not. It is in the ordinance committee, and I would say that there's a feeling of urgency from the developer and the administration to vote it out and to say, you know, we've been told the work is done, you can just vote it out. I'm not feeling that with myself. Mm -hmm. So the, or the ordinance has to, the current zoning has to change in order for this one project to be built. Correct. Okay. And the proposal and it applies has to every everything in this in this zoning district after that. The zoning district, I think, is like a, it's not the whole. It's a it's a new district, so it includes I okay. think eleven parcels. It's not the entire um, enterprise zone. It's a piece of the enterprise zone, but it's more than a quarter of the enterprise zone. Okay, who can? I, I was on the planning commission years ago when we when we past inclusionary zoning who can who can mandate whether build whether this new construction is rental or owner occupied can anyone do, can the city do that that is a question that I have um, it's not something that we typically deal with in zoning mm -hmm. can we deal with it in zoning <laughs> I don't know but what what the planners are telling us is certain housing styles lend themselves more to owner occupancy and the the obstacle is in financing is in getting financing um, you know you could build an eight-story building that has small units that are for sale I mean yeah. it's been yeah. it's been done here it's been done in other places yeah. but current financing um, makes it much harder to build that building as an owner-occupied building than as a rental building. Right, but I'm just thinking like partnerships with Housing Finance Agency and other organizations where, okay, they haven't done it before, but they could do it. Mm -hmm. You know, those, it, it's looking really at the whole set of institutions that make this happen and see where are the barriers. Yes. And what can we do about it? Yes. As opposed to, oh yeah, well, commercially it doesn't work. Right from a capitalist perspective. Yeah, but it's as 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 you know that it's it's a path of least resistance. Exactly. And but right now, the path of least resistance is rental housing. Right, and we need both. But I just really think that we need to not get caught with in the in the in the immediate present. Yes. Look at what we need. Yes. Jason. Thanks. Following right on that, has the administration, do you know if the administration has explored at all any uh, either partnerships or direct city funding mechanisms that would tilt the playing field in favor of uh, owner-occupied housing, like basically you know, providing some sort of guarantee or other, I don't know what mechanisms would be needed, but whatever it is that bridges the gap between it being feasible and not feasible, is that, is that kind of thing actually being contemplated in any active way? Not to my knowledge, and there is an MOU, so there is a public-private partnership that is between the city, um, the hula arm that's doing this is called Ride Your Bike, I think, um, and Champlain College. So there's an MOU, but it, it talks more about, you know, building parking garages together. Um, it does not, by my recollection, it does not address owner occupancy, but maybe that is, you know, maybe that's the tool that we need. Mm -hmm. And I think the community, need, we need to say, we're, there are a lot of us here, especially older people, who don't want a two-bedroom home or building. There's a whole different market that's being developed that is not, we're not building for. Honestly, we're probably not building enough for any sector of yep. the market, whether you're yep. looking for a studio yep. apartment or a four bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, have a yeah. quick comment and then a question, actually, for all of you. Um, the first comment is just the like, I would love to dive into some of the things that I disagree with what you were saying, but that's not really the avenue. But if anyone wants to talk to me about some of how I might see this in a different light, feel free to grab me after. Um, on the topic that I think the, the comment that I made at the beginning about 
how we see our neighborhoods changing in the future. One thing to think about it is every unit of housing that doesn't get built here is going to have to be built in your backyard, in our backyards, in the existing built environment, or be housing uh, deficits in the future. So that's just one comment on that. Um, the other question that I have for the three of you is actually around public transportation. Just seeing the the budget here for GMT, um, and you were talking about the the where GMT public transportation funding comes in at the state house as well. Um, it's my understanding that some of the problems or the bottlenecks in Burlington around increasing funding for public transit and building a more robust uh, transit system is kind of the funding model. And I'm wondering if there's been any movement or progress or collaboration in terms of the city talking to the state in terms of figuring out how those those issues can be resolved so that uh, yeah, I don't know enough to like be extremely targeted, but about that like the way that we fund it is kind of a little bit more regional and it makes it difficult for Burlington who has a much higher need for different types of transit than more uh, rural areas or, or more remote parts of Shindon County. Um, but anyway, just to kind of, as the three of you are here, to kind of, is there collaboration on that and are, could there be in the future? So I know I can't answer that, so I'm gonna roll back here. Uh, so I'd say, um, you're right, I mean, there is, Green Mountain Transit covers, you know, out to Jericho, right? Yeah. Um, it's, and, and what makes sense here in Burlington is not necessarily applicable, useful, or helpful in other locations. Um, how much, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of coordination between GMT and the state. There is some coordination that I'm aware of. I, I don't know. I, there could be a lot. I'm not, I don't know that there's a lot. I know that there is some coordination between GMT and, um, for example, when I chaired Burlington Electric Commission with the Burlington Electric Department to get the electric buses, that sort of thing. So there's definitely coordination. Uh, and then there's the overlay of the uh, Chittenden County uh, Regional Planning um, uh, Council um, with Charlie Baker there as head. What I'm going to suggest, because that's a really that's a really interesting question, and one of the pieces is I didn't delve into in terms of the transportation budget this past year is. Um, uh, there was uh, initially um, the proposal was to stop the fare free, like just carte blanche as of like June 30th, because that's what we had done from last year, um, mostly again with federal dollars. Uh, and what, what we ended up doing was figuring out a way to continue that for a bit longer while GMT reassesses what it costs to get um, you know, a new transit system that you can have like a swipey so that the folks that really can't afford to ride, uh, you know, can actually go through probably an inordinate amount of paperwork to actually get the, the car, but could then travel for free. Um, whereas folks like me would still pay. Um, so all of that being said, uh, let me get your name, yep. and because I, what I can't say is I know all the people that we could reach out to to find out what's being done, what's not being done, and is there a way to um, delve a little bit more specifically into how to address Burlington specific needs mm -hmm. within the broader GMT system. Yep. And it, to be clear, it's not specifically about maintaining the fare free program, but about no, bringing the the financial yep. balance of how Burlington can. Yep. Yeah, fund the transit. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Good. great. But at this point, is fare free extend to when? I have to get back to you. Well, I, I think, think we just saw it going through the end of the year. Yeah. I think yeah. it's January. Yeah. It was December, just yeah. end of calendar year. Calendar year. That's what, yeah. yeah. I thought it was end of calendar year. Um, I'm wondering if there is update about uh, from the uh, charter change committee on the police uh, oversight. Uh, at the city level, I'm also wondering if at the state level, if there is anything being done about setting a statewide standard on uh, police oversight by civilians. Um, and the other comment I want to make is that we uh, we were promised a robust discussion with public input on public safety, and it has been a struggle for many of us to actually even access this uh, this discussion. So I'm uh, wondering what the city is doing to make sure that uh, people who we need to hear from are actually participating. Um. Um, there, so the discussion about police oversight is in a joint committee of the Ordinance Committee and the Charter Change Committee 
which is um, chaired by Ben and by jointly by Ben as chair of ordinance and Jean Bergman as chair of charter change. Um, we did have one meeting. No, we had two meetings, I think. Um, and at this point, I think we're kind of gathering information at our last meeting we heard from one of the co-chairs of the police commission that were members of the public who participated in that and our it's it's challenging because that's a joint committee so it's a lot of people um also requires more people than just our committee and so it's been challenging to find meeting dates so our next i'm thinking our next meeting is like july 12th because that was the next meeting we could find um, and there, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember the suggestion of the um, co-chair, but I think one of the things that we're gonna have to wrestle with a little bit is there's some desire to give more authority to the um, police commission. And I think that there's also, I think there are police commissioners who think that's a grand idea. Other police commissioners who are feeling so overwhelmed by the volume of work that they have to do now, but there also could be more professional oversight. And I kind of think it would be interesting to look at, um, because Burlington actually wouldn't have, it's not like we have a huge number of complaints that need to be dealt with by somebody kind of outside the department. There's there's many complaints that can be, and, and this is according to the police commission that's reviewing these complaints. Many of these complaints can be resolved with little or no fanfare at all. They're very cut and dry and simple. And they're not necessarily big complaints, you know. A cruiser didn't put a blinker on when they turned, or they, you know, it, it can be some very little things. Um, but so for the big things, I think it would be good to have somebody at the state level who could um, adjudicate or facilitate uh, some of these things to raise them to a higher level to a body that to a public body that can um, review these cases. I do not feel, and others may disagree, there, there, there certainly are some people who think that they have the solution and the committee just has to approve the solution. I'm not one of those people. I see some challenges with, there's, there's good ideas, there's good elements of each and every proposal, and then there's other things that, um, you know, like what the police commission is experiencing. It's a lot of work. Who's going to do that work? What expertise do you need to do that work? So I think that there's there's a lot of questions to be answered, and I know that there is a desire to have more public engagement on this. So I appreciate your point, and that has been raised at the meetings as well. And I'll, I'll just say that, and I, for the life of me, I cannot remember its name, but there is a <clears throat> there is essentially a kind of a, a police law enforcement oversight. Um, group that was formed um, through legislation and I think it only, that's at the state level and I think it only really got formed um, last year and I, I, I need to check back in about that because um, I, I Is it the Vermont Criminal Justice, Criminal Justice Council? Council? I think that is, is, yes, I think it is the Vermont Criminal Justice Council but I, I have heard almost nothing about what they've been doing um, so uh, I can get back in. Maybe it's just that's if I get back to the whole NPA um, with. I think that has some really interesting potential. My understanding is that they're very, very, very backed up yeah. after. I thought it was, it's been open more than a year about that dump during COVID. <coughs> Well, I think it took a while to actually get it started. Yeah, started start and get it. members, you know, appointed to it and all of that. I mean, wow. it. <coughs> I know. Thank you. All right, folks. It's eight thirty. Um, I could ask questions about the South End of the all night, um, but it's school night. Not good. <laughs> 
not for the public schools. Um, let's leave it here. It's wonderful to see and hear everyone's questions, and it seems like three of you will be hearing from us, um, and we will be hearing from you um, on all of the things that have come up. And I guess my my one final question is just in terms of the the South End Innovation District and and the, the kind of questions about oversight of the police, like where's what are next steps? Should, are there dates we should be keeping an eye out for? The next, um, the next South End Innovation District meeting is going to be June 28th. Okay, great. Um, you can keep an eye on the city council, city calendar, on the city website, because um, I don't know at this time. I think it's going to. It's the meetings are usually at seven o'clock. I don't know what room. Usually it's at City Hall in the Busher Conference Room, but okay. it depends on if it's available. And then I think it's July 12th for the joint committee meeting. Great. We'll get that in advance. Yes, great. There is two go containers if you want to bring some food home. They have a lot of stuff over. Thank you. It's good. Thank you for eating. Thank you.